I'm glad to see all these familiar faces and a few unfamiliar faces. Um, for those of you who don't know who the Pilgrim Coalition is, we are a network of 28 member organizations and approximately 500 members. Um, we do not, um, nobody in our organization or network um, needs to be anti-nuclear, needs to be pro-nuclear. We simply ask that you fall underneath the heading of wanting to get together um, and collaborate uh, for the purposes of protecting our communities from the risks of Pilgrim nuclear power stations. So we're here together from coming from, from across the region, from some people from Boston, some from Cape Cod, um, and really to gather ideas to try to uh, figure out a way to ensure that our communities are safe and that we don't have to um, you know, bear the risk of Pilgrim any longer. Um, so if you haven't already signed in, please do. That's your opportunity to win a door prize, which um, we'll pass out after the panel speaks. Um, the purpose of tonight is really, uh, we all come to this issue from various points of the learning curve. Some of us are, have been doing this for a while, as the panelists here, have, you'll, you'll hear them speak. They clearly know a lot about the issues. Um, some after Fukushima. I didn't know anything about Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station until after Fukushima and uh, my learning curve was steep, but now I'm still learning. There's a lot I can learn about nuclear reactors and, and the process, but um, what I do know is enough to alarm me into action, and I'm hoping that other people here tonight will take on some of the responsibility uh, for themselves to help this growing movement. Um, we're also here to collaborate. At the end of the panel discussion, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. But I'd like to ask that people also throw out ideas. So you don't have to ask a question. You can also come up with an idea about how we can organize um, together as a movement and how we can mobilize more people. We can mobilize the greater Boston area. Um, if you've been reading the news down here, a lot of people believe, I've had people come up to me and say, oh, it seems like the reactor is closing down. I say, well, that's that's good that you hear that because it seems like the news is getting out that it's a threat. However, people in Boston, uh, several people we actually tabled, the Pilgrim Coalition tabled at the Patagonia store um, on Newbury Street, and people said to me, well, where is Pilgrim? So it's not, um, it's not an issue that's well known across the state. We need to get the word out. We need the Boston Globe to be covering this issue. We need other regional papers to be picking it up, and writing letters helps getting um, you know, the, the media to understand the issue helps even more. So thanks to WATD and other local stations who have been picking this issue up uh, regularly and the Cape Cod Times and other, the Patriot Ledger, other uh, publications um, were beginning that process. So uh, to begin, our first speaker is David Agnew. He's from the Cape Downwinders. Um, he moved to the Cape in 1986. He's married to a Cape native and he has three grown children. Um, he's had a deep and abiding interest in nuclear energy since reading We Almost Lost Detroit in 1975 and Honecker versus Henry, a lawsuit to end nuclear power in 1976. Um, he was initially concerned mostly with routine emissions and Chernobyl increased his concern for the risks of serious accident. And then Fukushima removed any doubt about the safety of Pilgrim's Mark I reactor design in his mind. Uh, David is a founding member of Cape Downwinders, and he serves on the uh, steering committee of Pilgrim Coalition. So, thank you, David. Thank you, Ron. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming tonight. And um, I just want to say that uh, when I do presentations, the ones that I've done, I have a tendency to make them way too long and go on and on. Um, so I'm trying something new, which is basically I've automated my presentation. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this efficiency comes at a price, however. Um, you're all going to have to do some reading. Because um, I find if I, if I say the words and you're trying to read them, you may, it tends to be confusing. So I'm, I'm not really going to say a whole lot. Um, but I do look forward to the Q&A part afterwards. And, um, so here, uh, obviously, is a map. And uh, you can see that uh, all of the Cape is within about 35 miles, uh, maybe 36, 7. Um, and the, just over the Sagamore Bridge is about 11 miles from Pilgrim. And uh, we're going to get into a little bit to uh, 
emergency planning uh, information later, but um, uh, because we're beyond 10 miles on the Cape, the NRC in its wisdom says that we have no danger of inhaling anything. We only have to worry about licking the ground or something like that. I never understood it. Um, I, I can't understand how uh, radioactive material ejected from Pilgrim would end up on the ground coming from Plymouth without traveling through the air, but evidently that's what they think. Um, so you can start. So this is basically what we've got. Um, and this is the most important information, that it's a Mark I designed around 64. So if you think back to the early 60s, this is, uh, you know, the mentality at the time. And it resulted in this uh, lovely thing here, which is a Mark I containment structure. Uh, I understand at Pilgrim most of this is underground, actually. Um, so, back as early as 1972, which was the year that Pilgrim began operation, uh, it was known to the regulators that this containment couldn't really contain. But they decided that it was more important to protect the industry than the citizens. So I'm going to go on a little jog through uh, memory lane, coming towards the future. So Brown's Ferry in Alabama was also a Mark GE Mark I reactor. They had a fire. Probably everyone's heard about Three Mile Island that, you know, basically it proved the system worked. Nobody was hurt. Everything was good. Um, that's the industry's side of the story. But there is another story, and that is that it wasn't so good, especially for young children. And if it was so good, I don't know why the industry had to pay out over $80 million in settlements. When you read the newspaper accounts of accidents, almost always, in, almost inevitably, they say uh, it, was a, it was not safe, the amount. It was not unsafe. There's no no safety problem, even though some radiation was released, but that's a non sequitur. There's no safe amount. So potassium iodide is, you know, doesn't really help in the big picture very much, but it's the only thing you can really do after, you know, if you're going to be exposed. So we shouldn't take it lightly. You see that women and children take the brunt. This was a, obviously a very serious disaster, uh, although you still see news accounts that say 31 people died there. National, New York Academy of Sciences says it's around a million. And um, <clears throat> the International Atomic Energy, like the rest of the industry, always looking on the bright side, they thought this was almost impossible, anything that could happen. This is a map of contamination from Chernobyl, which of course circled the globe many times. But there's the 50-mile zone, which outside of that, you know, is no problem at all. I always like to put containment when you're talking about a reactor like Pilgrim's in quotes.
Venting. Venting containments. <laughs> so this is an interesting thing I, I didn't know about before, but uh, <clears throat> Boston Edison was one of, I think, about 10 companies that sued General Electric after <laughs> they bought this reactor because uh, General Electric hadn't really tested it. Four, four meltdowns. No, I'm sorry, three meltdowns. Units one, two, and three melted down. Unit four blew up without any fuel in the reactor. This is unit three. Unit three had plutonium oxide fuel, uh, which isn't, isn't particularly why it looks so bad, but uh, it, uh, it, it supposedly did eject some fuel in the big explosion. It had a totally different explosion from the others, and that means it ejected plutonium. Plutonium's not good stuff to breathe. I mean, when you consider that they knew there was a 90% chance of the containments failing. This, this slide, um, in the lower right, you see a map of Japan, and the red is... Um, radioactivity measured by the Department of Energy, presumably by satellite, 25 hours after the accident. I don't know exactly what that means because the accident is still ongoing, but um, this was just very in the infancy of the whole problem. And it, the, the radio, radiation spread that far. So then we've superimposed that plume over southeastern Massachusetts, centering what was Fukushima over... Um, Pilgrim, and obviously the wind could be blowing a different direction, could be better, could be worse. Uh, these are 10, 20, and 50 mile radius maps around Pilgrim. Uh, if you'll notice, the 50 mile radius includes Providence and Boston, and um, the 50 mile radius is what the NRC ordered all Americans living in Japan to, to evacuate if they were within 50 miles of Fukushima. Local emergency planners cannot reject the plans. They, they neither approve nor disapprove them. They simply indicate that they have reviewed them. On the Cape, basically, they were clueless. Now, there's a video coming up here, a short video. So 
We're a sacrifice zone, and it's been clearly established that a great majority of Cape Codders uh, don't think that's acceptable. <laughs> We're expected to sacrifice for the profits of Energy Corporation. So this is, uh, you know, what we're dealing with, and our mission and our job is to make, try to make sure that this doesn't happen to us. That's it for me. Hey, okay, great. Thank you, David. Um, Mary Lambert, um, who many of you have heard from at uh, various points, she's been in this fight for a, a while, um, is the founder and director of Pilgrim Watch. Uh, Mary can see the reactor from her house. When she moved to Duxbury, the reactor was forced to shut down due to poor management. And this was reflected in an award for one of the dirtiest plants in the country, negatively impacting workers and significant releases when it opened, with bad fuel and no filtration. And it blew their filters in 1982. Um, despite community efforts, uh, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowed Pilgrim to reopen in 1990. Shortly after that, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health released their case control study showing that there was a fourfold increase in adult leukemia the closer you lived or worked to Pilgrim. Uh, the footprints of radiation-linked disease diseases persist. Mary. Uh, D David certainly had a tough act to follow. What I'm going to focus on is spent fuel. Uh, it might sound boring, but hopefully you will not be bored uh, by the end. When you walk out of here, you, the two things you've got to focus on is the critical importance of getting uh, the spent fuel out of the spent fuel pool and into dry casts. That is the main takeaway. And also, when we talk about dry casts that will be here certainly for hundreds of years, uh, that it be stored as safely as possible. So let's move forward. Next slide. Uh, some like it hot, but not radioactively. <laughs> especially in our backyard. And there is nothing hotter uh, initially thermally and radioactively as spent nuclear fuel. This is the stuff that was slated to go um, out to Nevada, Yucca Mountain, to be stored for hundreds of thousands of years deep under the earth, not on the shores of Cape Cod Bay, and not in our backyards. But that's what we're dealing with. Next slide. And so the, I don't know how much you know, but the question then becomes, what is uh, spent nuclear fuel? Uh, the way Pilgrim and any nuclear reactor um, generates electricity is using uranium in nuclear um, assemblies uh, to boil the water, to get the steam, to turn the turbine, and produce electricity. We talk in terms of nuclear assemblies, of which there are 580 in the core of the reactor. In each assembly are nuclear fuel rods, and in each rod there are lots of pellets. So you hear people talking about rods, but in, in reality they should be referring to assemblies. And so after a while, those assemblies um, become less useful for generating electricity, to, and then they become what is called spent, and they're then put into a, the spent fuel pool in the reactor. And this happens about every two years. About a third of the core is put into the spent fuel pool. Next uh, slide. Uh, here is a example of a, a diagram, rather, of what the spent fuel pool looks like at Pilgrim. Uh, the key point in red is inverted light bulb, and that surrounds the core. And it has a five foot thick reinforced concrete uh, material around it. So it is pretty hardy. 
Uh, however, the spent fuel is put in the the pool, which is colored blue, which is outside primary containment, and it's located in the upper level of the reactor with a roof that is designed to give in pressure uh, a pressure buildup. If there's an explosion, the roof is fragile, so it will give, the thinking was, it would then shoot the plume higher up into the atmosphere and it would be carried and diluted at certain distances. However, it's really not a good idea, particularly with terrorists or a Timothy McVeigh's who could get hold of a very small airplane uh, and penetrate the roof into the pool and if the water in that pool drops simply to the top of the assemblies, there would be a spent fuel pool fire uh, that in all practicality could not be put out and would contaminate uh, a geographic area more than Massachusetts and bring about, according to the Mass Attorney General, $488 billion in damages and 24,000 latent cancers. And so you could kiss the economy of this of Massachusetts and a greater region goodbye so that is a problem <laughs> next slide please uh, the, the problem not only is the location of the spent fuel pool outside primary containment in it in the attic but that is very crowded uh, initially the thought was when the reactor was built that the fuel um, would be reprocessed, taken, taken away, reprocessed, and turned into bomb-making material. However, Jimmy Carter made a wise decision that we really had too much of that stuff in the world, and so reprocessing ended, and the thought next was we would find an off-site repository. Of course, that never happened. So the choice was either you allowed more and more of that fuel in a pool or turn off the key. And so the decision was made to allow Pilgrim and other reactors to increase from the original design. Originally that pool was designed for 880 assemblies and then they were allowed to max out at 3,880. And so as a result, they're very, very crowded. And therefore, there can be no air circulation if there's a problem to then allow time, which the original design had in mind, uh, to keep for air convection to keep the pool cool until they fix the problem. So being tightly packed and in now a closed frame, sort of like a wine rack, uh, you're, you're asking for a fire if water drops. And again, the consequences, as I said before, are horrendous. Next slide. Uh, what could cause a pool fire? Many things. A malicious attack is uh, certainly conceivable and Pilgrim's Pool is vulnerable. Loss of electric power, because the electric power is necessary to keep the pumps and the dials going, to keep the water circulating, so the water can then cover um, the assemblies and keep them cool. If you have a prolonged loss of power, then you're in trouble. And you can then result in a situation of boil off and uncovering then the assemblies. There can be human error. Uh, that's what caused Chernobyl. Someone reads a dial wrong, someone thinks uh, a valve is open when it's not open, someone misreads the, uh, the uh, temperature of the water, what have you. And you can also have a reactor accident mitigating into the pool because they're in the same building. And actually that's what happened at Fukushima uh, unit 3, the hydrogen migrated into Unit 4 and caused the explosion there. And you can just have a natural disaster. Next slide. 
Uh, that is the example of what happened in Pilgrim Sister Plant <laughs> in Japan. Very fortunately, the water is still in that pool, and people are crossing their fingers because if it drops, another earthquake, or what have you, Japan is gone. Next. Uh, how can you reduce the risk? It's quite simple. You thin out the pool by moving the fuel that's in the pool into dry casts when they're cool enough to do so. Certainly, five years out of reactor, the assemblies are cool enough to put into dry casts. The advantage of dry casts are they're passive. You do not need uh, human intervention. You do not need electricity. They're passive structures that can handle themselves. When you looked at uh, Fukushima, um, most of the fuel was in dry casts, and they did just fine. With a horrendous tsunami earthquake, they were not damaged. Very different story in Unit 4. And casts cost about $1.5 million each, and that is really the reason that Entergy has chosen not to uh, take the safer route and thin out that pool. Next slide. Uh, here's a picture of a dry cast. This is what will be on the shores of Cape Cod Bay. Uh, they are very large structures, as you can see uh, by the workers and the size of them. Next slide. Uh, this is the type of cast that Pilgrim is planning to use. It's called the Holtec High Storm 100. The assemblies are the inner yellow tubes, and then you have um, a steel cylinder, and then concrete wall outside. There are holes in the bottom and the top to produce what I, I guess you call the chimney effect uh, to provide natural coolant uh, for the assemblies inside. Uh, next slide. Because there isn't reprocessing, there is not a Yucca Mountain, and there isn't a radioactive waste ferry. So, what is going to happen? Next slide. Uh, this is what the Nuclear Regulatory <coughs> Commission uh, thinks and says is going to happen to Pilgrim's spent fuel. They are they are saying in a draft document that will be finalized this fall that the spent fuel can remain either in the pool and a pool at full capacity or in dry casts or a combination of the two until 2092. That will be when the pool is 120 years old. And all its support structures are 120 years old. Now, also keep in mind that when Pilgrim ceases to generate electricity, that is money, uh, they're going to be less enthusiastic about spending and investing in that facility. So that's a problem. Uh, then after 2092, they don't have to keep it until 2092, but they can. After that, for the next 300 years, they envision it being in CAS at Pilgrim Station. Every hundred of those 300 years, they are to change clothes, to change uh, the CAS, and also to make a new pad. Then after 300 years, from 2092, they envision an indefinite in storage until an off-site um, facility is developed. But unfortunately, every state has two senators. And none of those senators are <coughs> raising their hands and saying, we want to be it. Next slide. So that's NRC's vision. Uh, here's Entergy's vision. They envision keeping the spent fuel pool tightly packed and only while they're operating, removing 
what they need to move to get in the next download. They, will, they are now at maximum capacity. They have 3,200 and change in the pool now, and they are required to leave space for full core download. So that's where they are. If they can't move forward to dry cast storage, they cannot operate after a year from this spring. So what they plan to do is to take out enough assemblies which would produce about three or four dry casts every two years. That's their plan. Uh, the casts uh, will be lined up on a pad that they have now practically finished building, which is beside the reactor uh, facing Cape Cod Bay. Uh, this is a pad where they envision putting all the casts lined up, and someone very cleverly referred to it as candle pin bowling for terrorists. Uh, not a good plan, as opposed to doing something smarter, which would be dispersing them. Uh, the pad is located, and Pine will talk about this, 100 yards from the bay at 25 feet mean sea level. Uh, it seems that they had not been doing a lot of research into sea level rise, which is anticipated, and storm surges. Uh, also, there are no monitors planned to be on, uh, on top of the cast uh, for radiation and temperature. Um, there is no cover on the cast, and uh, that's their plan. Their plan, not surprisingly, is um, guided by economics. Uh, next slide. Uh, a safer plan, if we ruled the world, would be first for security to disperse the cast and put earthen berms up around them. So if they were, if, let's say, if one was targeted, the amount of radioactive release would be far less than if 40 of the bowling pins, so to speak, went down. And it would be much harder target, targets because the berms would serve uh, to prevent line of sight targeting. Uh, for mitigation, we would like to prevent a uh, blockage of the necessary air ventilation holes on the bottom and the top. Uh, this could be done by having the casts in a building or having some sort of carport arrangement. Uh, because actually, all it takes is a day, I understand, for birds to make a nest. And that has been a problem, uh, birds nesting on top of casts and blocking the air hole. Uh, monitoring. Obviously, we'd like monitoring to get a heads up if there's any leakage or uh, heat buildup. We would like also spare overpacks to be on site. And the reason for this is if there is degradation identified or a leak, you've got to have a new change of clothes right away. And a spare over what that would be would be to add an overpack. But you don't want to be ordering an overpack when you're in trouble. You like to have them on site. Also, when we get to the point of decommissioning the reactor, it's important to keep a spent fuel pool because obviously if you are going to have to deal with a leaking cast, you've got to get it back in water somehow if an overpack which would be a, a giant band-aid, is not going to work. Uh, also for flooding, as Pine will talk about, you would obviously locate it, locate the pad at a higher elevation, or ideally locate a uh, dispersed cast at a higher location. Well, that would be good. Next slide. Uh, cast are far safer than a spent fuel pool. So the number one ask or letter to, you know, papers, etc., is to get 
that pool thinned out and emptied. However, the game's not over if that happened because casts, although they're safer, are not without risk. Each cask uh, contains um, half the cesium-137 that was released uh, in Chernobyl. That's serious. Uh, so therefore, it's important to get safer dry cast storage, but also it's important to have off-site emergency planning continue after the reactor shuts down. I am making comments now, and hopefully others will do the same. There is an NRC document out for comment now that um, has emergency planning off-site stopping essentially a year after the reactor shuts down. And quite clearly, what we would want, and this has happened around the country, a couple of reactors that have shut down, like Kiwani in Wisconsin, um, they, they asked the NRC to stop pl emergency planning off-site, and it was granted. And so this is what is going to happen, and it's important, obviously, that emergency planning and monies for communities for their responsibilities uh, continue because the risk doesn't disappear. And that's an important message here when the key is turned off. Uh, next slide. Yeah, we need your help. Uh, there's a lot to worry about, and I think the message uh, that I'd like to give is many people, and I certainly felt it initially, if the reactor closes down, happy days, I'm bringing the champagne. Now, granted, if the reactor is shut down, risk does decrease, but the spent fuel will be there both in the pool and in dry gas, certainly beyond my lifetime. And therefore, it's important that one battle can be won, but vigilance and getting more people involved, making it an issue during the campaign for governor and all the other offices uh, so that we can have a safer future. So look, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mary. Um, next we have Pine Dubois. Uh, Pine is the executive director of the Jones River Watershed Association. Um, Pine was first involved with the successful effort to stop Pilgrim 2, which was a, another reactor that was going to be built in this area um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And most recently with the relicensing process as um, to Pilgrim's ongoing impacts on the fisheries and habitats of Cape Cod Bay. Pine's our um, local water expert, so <laughs> thank you, Pine. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everybody, for uh, coming and making it worth it to have put the slides together, even if they don't have extra special effects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I just want to orient you a little bit more toward the site and to talk about those things that are water-related. Um, as Anna said, you know, I work for the Jones River Watershed Association, and our main uh, mission in life is to help the fisheries um, and the river be restored. So we're concerned about uh, fish numbers, and that has to do uh, essentially because we all depend on them. Uh, we, we are concerned about the river herring in particular uh, because they feed all of the big fish in the bay um, and because we like to eat those big fish. And they also do a lot of ecosystem services for the rivers and the bay itself. And so, you know, that focus um, uh, brought us to comment on the relicensing procedure in 2006. And it was then that we realized that this Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, in its effort to cool and discharge all of the waste heat, um, two-thirds of the energy it produces is, is wasted um, out into Cape Cod Bay. But in the process of sucking in 510 million gallons a day, they suck in our fish. 
And the alewives and the river herring are the third most impinged fish in that count. So thousands a year. In fact, in the middle 80s, there was 25,000. But, you know, there, in addition to all of the rest of the plants and animals totaling in the neighborhood of 14 billion a year. So it's the impact on Cape Cod Bay that brought us to this concern. Uh, Jones River is um, a mere eight miles from there. Um, but the point of this side, so, so this is uh, on the top, you see the Gurnet, and here's Plymouth Beach. So go in through um, Bug Light there, and you're headed straight for the Jones River. So, so we're very close. And all our fish have to swim right by that Pilgrim Power Station. So that's, that's what's going on. Uh, they also decided that uh, there was a significant impact on the, on the Jones River species of rainbow smelt, and last year we had none. So um, this is a matter of concern uh, that, that needs to be addressed. So it was, in this re it was this reason that we began our effort um, with uh, the EPA and the DEP and the Mass Coastal Zone Management uh, to address what is known as the NIPDES permit, so the Non-Point Source Discharge Elimination System, which is a permit that was required when the Clean Water Act was adopted <clears throat> back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there's been a lot of changes to it, but essentially when you are going to pollute a water of the United States, you need a permit to do that, and that permit sets limits on what you can do, and it controls. Uh, this permit expired 18 years ago. So what we're trying to do is get um, the, the agencies and the regulators back uh, into the position of actually uh, regulating the system. But again, the point of this slide is straight out to the northeast is England. <clears throat> so when you have a northeaster, you have a heck of a fetch. And uh, that's what I want to talk about. So if you wouldn't mind. This is uh, the water intake structure for uh, many of you know it, some of you don't, so uh, just a little review. You see the two um, uh, jetties pointing out. Those jetties, the top elevation is about 10 and a half uh, mean sea level. Uh, I've spent a lot of time kind of sorting out datum, so uh, I'm going to try and stick to one. Uh, the water is intaked into the station right there. Uh, that first building is the reactor building. Those little cylinders right there, uh, the two closest to the building, the, the rectangles are the condensates, and the two out in front of it are uh, water tanks, and in between are buried oil tanks. And those buried oil tanks are to run the emergency generators. In between is the tritium leak that we've been talking about for so much, and that the Department of Public Health has been tracking. Uh, one of the things that we found, did find out is that there's a wall between where that arrow is into the intake structure, to the turbine building, to the reactor building, to the rad waste building, uh, and the generator building that's 50 feet down underground. <clears throat> and so it's more than likely that whatever tritium leak is leaking there into the ground is also going into the bay. It is being sucked into the plant and then discharged. See where it says dumping to the bay? So all of that water spends 15 minutes inside the plant and comes out hotter than the bay water. And it also becomes an attractant to fish. So why did everybody used to go fishing there? Because it was great fishing. <laughs> um, but when you read the reports, you also find out that the river herring which are intended to, or, or their normal habitat is to spawn in fresh water uh, up in the headwater ponds um, uh, where their larvae grow up and then they come out to sea. That, in t that um, <clears throat> discharge canal has larvae and eggs of river herring. So, um, give me another. So in this slide, this was, you, you know, I, did, I should have pointed out the boat ramp, but you see the boat ramp there. <clears throat> um, this, we just discovered uh, these cylinders that are right there that the arrow is pointing to. That's called low-level uh, rad waste storage. And the building next to it is where they compress that rad waste 
uh, so that they can fit it into those cylinders. And those cylinders are meant to be buried for 300 years. It's called C&D Rad Waste. It used to go south to Barnswell, <clears throat> but no more because that got closed. Now it can't go anywhere. So we had a little conversation with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, last week, and because we had asked them, is that really rad waste next to the coast? See where I have 12 MSL standing for mean sea level? That's how high it is right there. Now the tide in our place inside the buildings eight miles away and a mile and a half up the Jones River on January 2 was 14 the tide, not the 15, 20, 30 foot waves that were on top of the tide, just the tide. So that's what the mean sea level is about. And you see the eroded bank and there's 30 feet between the eroded bank and those cylinders. So I asked the NRC, I said, how many cylinders are there? Well, we don't know. But, but Entergy knows because we make them write it down and they know how much is there. And every two years we ask them. And so they tell us. I said, well, you know, we're, we've been having some really big storms lately. How would you know if one of those cylinders rolled into the bay? And there was silence, literally. And they promised us eventually that when they're here in May, they will take a look. But no one told Entergy they could put it there. They just decided. It's just like they deciding that um, they're going to put the uh, uh, pad over there in the corner at 24.5 mean sea level. So this is the rest of the place. So you see how what a giant wall is protecting it? Um, so, so again you have the, the, the pumps and the water tanks and the condensate and the leaking tritium and the turbine building and the rad waste building all at 20 mean sea level. Um, but you have 12 mean sea level here. And the velocity zone, according to FEMA last year, was 18. Well, I got 18 behind the building. So I'm wondering what's keeping the water from flooding everything around there. Now, again, that's just the velocity zone. Then you can put a wave on top of it of any amount. Two feet, five feet, 15 feet, 30 feet, and what's going to happen? Those generators going to work? We're not so sure. Why would you put a pad um, 150 feet at 24 and a half mean sea level next to Cape Cod Bay to put uh, spent fuel on it that you need King Tut's tomb for? And even King Tut's tomb is only several thousand years old. That's not long enough. And, you know, this is the, you, you know, you see, the, the, the fact of the matter is they have alternatives. You see that 50 up there in the right-hand corner? That's where their uh, wastewater treatment plant is up in that parking lot. That's, uh, that's elevation. Uh, there's, it's a little unsure whether it's 50 or 70. But it's very close. And it's inside their, their you know, uh, they're, they're got their helipad up there, you know. The top of the elevation is 90. So it's, it's close. So our question is, why are you putting it next to the coast? Um, so the fact of the matter is that it is, in fact, our backyard. And the, other, the, and the problem with that is got to take care of it. You know, it's not that we don't want to share it with anyone. It's that we don't want that anyone to make it impossible to live here. Your 12 mean sea level, again, those are the, those are the uh, containers right there. Um, so there's plenty of room for the water to come in is the point. Um, and it's not uh, something they can pump out. Yeah, it's, it's 30 feet from the casks to the eroded bank, 30 feet. So we're preparing a, um, uh, a uh, request for determination to the Plymouth Conservation Commission to ask them, do you tell them it was all right to put it here? But we know that they will say, just like the zoning board said, you know, 
they can do anything they want. Well, it's our opinion that they can't do anything they want and they shouldn't do anything they want without a lot of people looking at it and starting to pick it apart. Um, these are, this, I took this from the NOAA website, and again, this is just uh, 1998 to 2008, and it's the significant wave height. This is from the Boston uh, NOAA t uh, buoy, and it measures surge and it measures wave height. And it's the mean. And you see this side here, the vertical axis, is in meters. The average in October is 30 feet. So I'm not making it up. And we're not talking about sea level rise yet. But the, the problem with sea level rise is we don't know whether it's coming up a foot or six feet in the next 50 or 60 years. And we don't know how fast it's coming up. But from what the IPCC said, IP, whatever, that, <laughs> uh, said the, the, over the weekend is it's more serious, more damaging, uh, m more accelerated than we thought. And last year, people agreed that in this region, you know, sea level is, ri is rising faster than the global average. And this you have to understand. So. So here's your wave, here's your site. I flattened out Google Earth a little bit. This is the boat ramp again where 12 is, and that's your 30-foot wave. So you can um, begin to imagine, uh, so, and, and somebody was very interested in the pad, so you can see where the, the discharge cana canal is right here. That's how close we're talking about, and that's the elevation of the land next to it. Um, so another, another of our issues, uh, there's that 18 mean sea level that I was trying to show you before is down there behind the reactor building. Um, so these other things, uh, there's a wastewater treatment plant of, up there. Of course, it's a domestic wastewater treatment plant. It only processes 37,000 gallons a day, but it's domestic. Um, this is the leaching field out here on Rocky Hill Road, um, and we're beginning to look at uh, that because there's excessive nitrogen um, going into that leaching field that is 400 feet from the from the bay. We know the groundwater is going that way, or at least everybody says so. Um, it's 10 times more than is allowed by the town of Plymouth's wastewater treatment plant. And you know, just so you know, I don't. I'm not making it all up. We have spent a lot of a time and effort in digging through everybody's files and we came up with this gorgeous site plan that has all the benchmarks on it. So um, we're using this and we want to put together some good, good site maps, good plans together with the sea level rise datum that we have um, to try to bring uh, to the NRC, EPA, DEP, CZM, uh, and the town of Plymouth so that they will begin to take their responsibility in earnest and understand that we know what's going on and we're going to make them with your help. Thank you, Pine. I hope you all agree that the three panelists were quite diverse in their um, displays of... Uh, of their PowerPoints and their information. So it was really helpful to have all three of you present tonight. Thanks again. Um, we are going to open it up to a question and answer and idea period. Um, before you speak, if you would state your name and your organization or your town first, that would be great. If you want to direct the question to anybody in particular, feel free to do so. If you want to just talk to the crowd and, and you know raise ideas, that's fine too. Um, do we have any beginning questions or ideas for people out here? Yes, I'm going to pass you the, the microphone. Please state your name. Um, my name is Gary Pantelandolfo. I'm from Can. I drove about three hours from Northwest Connecticut. Wow. Oh, my friend Pat. Thank you. Um, Regarding that last presentation, when you measured that high tide at your office up the river, were those waste casks in the water, do you know? I, I really don't know. They won't let us on the site, um, which is a little difficult. We, we've tried to get over there with, um, with kites and cameras to look, but in storms it's, a little, it's difficult to do that. And we've gone over in boats. We had a flotilla last, uh, 
that summer and were met with a machine gun <laughs> daring vehicle. So uh, they're not, and I think the Pilgrim 14, some of whom are here tonight, tried to just deliver a, a letter and got arrested. So. You know how long they've been there? Uh, since 2006, uh, they, they add to them because they take the waste uh, that they have that is considered C and D level waste, which is more than A. A is like the suits that get contaminated. So there's a little more contaminated stuff uh, that they, in that building, they actually compress it. Then they put it into an ethylene kind of a, you know, like a, a thick fiberglass maybe cylinder and then they put that into the concrete and it's supposed to take the weight of all kinds of soil on top of it for anybody for 300 who's years who's not familiar with how they classify waste low level waste is a misnomer yeah some of it really is low level um, a lot of it is deadly i mean there's plutonium in there it's, it's, cesium. i think it's all deadly if you get close enough to it's um it includes things like the sludge from the filters from the reactor I think any I mean, of the components, everything but the fuel rods. Yeah, it was the the pipe resin that we were looking for when we first started looking. Thank you for your long drive. You're welcome. Other questions or ideas? Elaine Dickinson, the uh, Cape Down Windows. My question is, who pays for this long-term maintenance? of these casks. Is it Intergy? Is it the taxpayers? Yeah. Technically, the licensee is responsible for all waste on site until it leaves the property. Then it becomes the responsibility of the federal government. That was decided in the 1982 um, Waste Policy Act. Uh, the question obviously is that uh, they're always ahead of us. <laughs> Entergy, when it bought Pilgrim, uh, formed a limited liability company. And so the fear, obviously, unless you're an Entergy stockholder, is that after a while they're going to declare bankruptcy and be out of there. There'll be no pockets to pick because they're a limited liability company. And so um, we'll see what happens. Um, I, I would bet it, it's obviously going to be the responsibility of Massachusetts. And if you look at Connecticut, with Connecticut Yankee, it's a slightly different story, but when their um, decommissioning trust fund money came up short for cleaning up that site as the responsibility of Connecticut taxpayers. So it's a limited liability. It was a good move on their part. Other questions? Or ideas? Kathy Darden, Ducks Ferry. Um, I wanted to say first, Mary, I moved here 10 years ago, and I feel like you educated me uh, through my reading in local papers about your activities uh, regarding pilgrims. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, I live around the corner and belong to Jones River, uh, and I kayak at Stevens Field in Plymouth, so I feel like I have a real active investment. Um, I'm not around a lot because of travel, but I would like to do more. Um, my travel is for my work. I wish it weren't, but uh, I would like to do more. And one of the things that stopped me this year is that I felt at loose ends with what was needed. So a suggestion I have is that I think from other groups I've belonged to over the years of organizations, that um, having talking points uh, given to members that they can then go out um, those of us that don't have the time, for instance, to put together great slideshows and things, if you all or the more educated folks in here can put talking points together um, and either ask us to organize groups or give us groups that you've organized where we can educate people, I think that that would be really helpful. 
Um, so it's just one idea, but as I'm, I'm sitting here listening, I keep racking my brains for what can I do that in the time that I have, because I want to do something. Thank you so much. Um, we actually, this is part of the, the, uh, the um, con concluding segments of my, of my remarks, uh, but we have a legislation sheet in the back, and it lists four pending bills that are currently um, at the State House, and we need support of those pending bills. So I think a talking point sheet would really pair well with something like that, because people can start to speak about the issue, but also engage the public and your neighbors, um, and try to figure out ways to put pressure on the legislature so that we can move these bills forward to protect our, our area. Um, we also need to try to keep things going on town meeting agendas um, and on town ballot questions um, across the Cape. Uh, they've been very successful at putting, um, a, you know, questions on the on the warrants or ballots um, to move people in the community to think about these issues. And this is something we can do locally and afar. If we have contacts in different um, towns across the state, we can get these people to start putting things on their town meeting warrants. So. Uh, these are other things we can do, but please do take a handout in the back on the table that uh, per uh, you know, pertains to the legislation in particular. Well, thank you for the idea. I, I would urge everyone to take all one of these handouts, whatever is back there. Uh, just to add to that, um, uh, we did ex exact a, um, a commitment from EPA to um, reissue the draft permit by September this September. They had promised us last December. Um, things happen. Now it's September. Uh, and we're doing everything that we know how to do to make sure that that happens. But that process is, um, is a public process. And so there will be opportunities for people to comment on their permit. What we hope that will happen is that uh, they will require what is called a closed loop cooling system which would um, mean that instead of using 500 uh, million gallons a day, they might use a couple hundred thousand. Uh, this would cons considerably reduce the impingement and entrainment of species, um, and it, it would mean probably cooling towers and that sort of thing. But it, it, there's no doubt that Entergy will not want to do that, and it will take an enormous public comment from a lot of people to sustain an EPA request on that. At the same time, um, DEP has to sign off on it, so it's, a, it's kind of a joint federal-state um, affair. But even now, you know, talking to DEP and DPH whenever you have... It, it's, well, Mary has educated me a lot, too, in that She's got a question, she just goes ahead and sends them an email, <laughs> you know, and they have to answer it. <laughs> and it. And it gets the conversation going and it makes people think. And I think that this is a good strategy for people, you know, that, that you know, call us up if you want to get more informed about something um, and you're stuck on something so that you can then do stuff like that because it means a lot. The people that are regulating want to do the right job. They haven't been allowed to do the right job. And if people get behind them, they will do the right job. So it's a, it's a democratic balance and uh, we need to be engaged in that in order to make it work. Um, yes, let, let me just add that um, most of the people, not all, in agencies probably do want to do a good job. Sometimes they actually make good suggestions, but when it goes up to the top, uh, often it gets changed. And the reason being politics. And so what you can do, this is a perfect time. All the people who are running for office are going locally and having question and answers. Every time, go to them and bring up, how do you feel about Pilgrim? Do you want to have it closed? Yes or no? And so that they will understand that this 
is a really important issue. Oh, and that's what I've done and intend to do. And so far, I can say um, two of the gubernatorial candidates have come out, Steve Grossman and Martha Coakley. Uh, Warren Tolman has come out. And so what about the rest? What about your locals? If you live in the Cape, you know, God, you know. And Congress. Congressman Markey is uh, fabulous. He has been known, a senator rather, excuse me, he has been known for years as the top person in Congress on nuclear safety. What about other people who are running in office now, whether it be a re local representative, state senator, doesn't matter what it is. They have to understand that to be elected, this is the issue they have to make a commitment on. Period. Amen. So that's one thing. Plus, the Pilgrim Coalition's website uh, does have a calendar and does have contact information of different groups with emails so you can get in touch. And hopefully we'll be able to have the time to follow up your suggestion and get simple bullet points. Thanks. Um, in that talk about uh, you know politicians, um, I just uh, William Keating, I think, is uh, your congressman for, or maybe not, right here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So William Keating has uh, has told people this is like at the top of his agenda or something like that. But in fact, he has written one letter uh, a year ago. It was kind of lukewarm. Uh, no, I didn't he's correct. No what? He's written no letters. No, he signed, uh, I know he he signed, signed on. on. He signed on he to signed on. one, two, or three of Marty's. Yeah. Oh, no, but I mean, a letter from us. Yeah. You want to clarify? All right. Uh, last year, uh, Cape Town Windows had a meeting with uh, Representative Markey and asked him if he would amend the Atomic Energy Act to bring the... Um, Keating. Uh, Keating. Keating, sorry. <laughs> Representative Keating, yes. And asked him if he would amend the Atomic Energy Act, given the, uh, um, after the court case in Vermont, um, to bring back the um, rights of the states to um, be responsible for public health and safety. Um, and so we met with him in August, and he took it under advisement, we sent letters, called, no response, so then we met with Michael Jackman, his aide, in December. We said we'd like to have an answer in a month, no response, so I spoke with him just this week when he was at uh, Representative Peake's um, announcement of her uh, running again, and she's wonderful, she says shut it down. Um, and he, again, just backed right off. He would not make a commitment to say that Pilgrim needs to be closed, and that. Again, too, if you know about the Cape, the public safety cannot be assured they're closing the bridges and we're taking the radiation hit and then we're going to be relocated and that's so unacceptable and that our congressman isn't standing up for us is really outrageous. So I would say give him a call, give him a call and ask those questions. But he needs to make a commitment. I, I have a question, Diane. <clears throat> you blended two things. One, uh, you blended two things. One issue was asking him uh, for to amend the a, atomic energy, uh, that's one. The second was to commit to shutting it down. What were you referring to? I'm sorry, gave you two letters. <laughs> one was to make a public statement that uh, to close Pilgrim because the public safety cannot be assured he won't do that. And the second one was to amend the atomic energy act. So we gave him two letters. We gave them him again in December the two letters, we emailed, nothing. So he was mm -hmm. not responding at all. I think uh, amending the AEC, I can understand his position. It, we not just the respond. other. Yeah. You know, he could say, no, I don't want to do it. He won't respond at all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the, the microphone back here. To I don't Bruce. really need a microphone. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happier without a microphone. We all are. But you <laughs> Should I use the microphone? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know how. <laughs> uh, my name is Bruce Tab. I'm from Orleans, and uh, I don't know why I do this. I don't like to come to terrifying movies. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't watch horror movies, and this is so surreal and simultaneously disturbing. And so 
I understand that people get involved. They write letters, they write demonstrations, they get arrested, they try to pass legislation, blah, 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 blah. They try to improve the conditions at the plant, at least. But what's missing for me, relative to the comment about talking points, what's missing for me is a vision, a concrete set of, I don't know what to call it, what would result in the closing of the plant? That's what I want to know. Not that, so now Keating waves his hand and says, okay, or Marky waves his hand, or Grossman says, I'm in favor of it, or so what? This. Well, yeah, so how do you get to that? I want to know, I don't want to know abstractly about signing things. I want to know what will, I want a picture, a scenario, a timetable, or whatever. Besides well, an accident, too. terrorist attack, and any disaster like that. I want to know how we close the plan. I think that the, the short answer is there's no silver bullet. Uh, but let's ha ask uh, Mary what, what her longer answer is. Oh, I, I raise money. Yeah. And one of the major things you talk about legislation is coming up with legislation on the state and local level that's going to cost energy bucks. Because they are losing money now. And so if we can come up with legislation on the local and also a state level that would tax spent fuel, number one, also a trust for decommissioning to be able uh, to cover the difference. There are uh, a lot of, um, I, I've actually suggested four or five to Senator Wolf to work on you know, concepts that will cost money. That is, I, I think, one significant way to go. Um, unfortunately, to dealing with the NRC, uh, as I was talking to Marky's aides today, they're worse on, with each day, they get worse and worse. So that's a problem. So the NRC is not and the answer. If a, if a piece of legislation passed that was in conflict with the NRC? Well, that would be in a problem, but the state and local communities does have authority. If you never mention safety or health, and it's all focused on economics, and certainly you can have a tax situation focused on the economic uh, costs that the um, having all the fuel there will uh, bring about. It's in, and so you put it just in economics because that's a game you can play. One idea. I mean, there are others. Speaking of speaking of economics, too, you know, your property has zero value if there's an accident, pennies to the dollar. So we're talking about ideas surrounding per, perhaps property that has nothing to do with safety or health. It has to do with economics. So we need to. This is. But I'm talking about creative thinking. We need to get creative. I'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, Janet Azarovitz and uh, from the Cape Down Winders. Uh, getting back to some individuals that will bring some uh, some benefit to this conversation. Uh, I brought some nomination papers for uh, a, a man from Falmouth, Matt Patrick, who's running for the seat of uh, Therese Murray when she leaves. Uh, he is, he's done a great deal for the safety of individuals on the Cape. He was very instrumental in bringing potassium iodide into the homes, into the schools of uh, families on the Cape, and including Cape Ann, I believe. Um, so he's running for her seat, and there are nomination papers out there. Anybody from Pembroke or Kingston, Plymouth, um, Falmouth, Bourne, Sandwich, if you would want to sign his papers, they, you know, they're going to be collecting them, I think, on Monday. So he's a good man. I know that Mary Lampert has worked with him. David has. Diane has. Uh, so that would be someone that could do something. And he does want to close the plant. He said that, that that's going to be a top priority. So that's important to us on the Cape especially. Thank you, Janet. I'm going to take the mic to the back of the room here. We have about 10 minutes, and we're going to wrap it up soon. So. Gary from Can again. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, you probably are, 
Vermont Yankee is going to close by the end of 2014. Energy made that announcement just a few months ago. Now, CAN has worked hard with a lot of other groups in the legislature. The legislature, the governor, are all opposed to running the plant. Um, you know, there were lawsuits, NRC hearings. Energy successfully fought all those off and just belligerently kept running the plant, even though they agreed when they bought it that they'd close it by now. The reason they're closing it is money. They're losing money. And they're also losing money on Pilgrim. They're losing money on Indian Point. I believe they own Fitzpatrick in New York. Um, we, we really think, Cam thinks, that there's a good chance that they close several more reactors within the next year, yeah. or at least decide to close. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think just a lot of citizen pressure, whatever you do in the legislature, I don't think a bill to close it is going to do anything from our experience. Yeah. In Massachusetts, they just ignored it. But what could get their attention would be forcing them to redo their cooling system, which is going to be expensive. That could add another chunk to the bottom line that tells them it's time to close this one, too. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, last questions? Yeah, I just have one question. How much does the federal government give the nuclear in corporate welfare? Yeah. The main thing is the insurance that's subsidized. I mean, basically, they're insured because. So, do we have a specific answer, Mary? No one would commercially insure these plants. I don't know a number, but I. Can you tell us how to find the information? Uh, Google's your friend. I don't know. Um, no, I don't have a number. That'd be great if you could find out, or if we could all know. But I do. I will just point out that. Um, from, um, I, I believe uranium enrichment is subsidized. I could be wrong about that. The uh, nuclear waste is subsidized in the sense that although the, the ratepayer, one thing I want to point out is the industry likes to cry because they've been contributing money to the waste repository from, I don't know, almost the beginning. Um, and the repository hasn't happened, so they feel shortchanged. But it's not their money, it's the ratepayer's money. It hasn't cost their executives or their stockholders a cent. Um, um, but also, uh, you know, from uranium mining and, and uh, milling, the health effects there, the polluted water. So we, we all subsidize in very, very significant ways. Um, so I don't know, that's probably not an answer to your dollar. Well, I just wanted to say uh, on your concrete, if we could shut off monies coming from the state and the federal government, wouldn't it force them to do uh, that? Yeah, but dream on, sweetheart. That's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> well, uh, it, uh, to answer to your specific question, uh, ask uh, or email Tim Judson, who you must know, who is uh, director now of Nuclear Information Resource Service, N-I-R-S. Dot org and you can get the contact information. He could give you the exact numbers. And also, the important uh, new game in town is the effort of uh, the nuclear industry, including Entergy, to have the game to get more subsidies because they are feeling short-changed in the merchant markets. Yeah, because they cannot compete, and they think it's very unfair that uh, wind and solar and other sources have been getting a leg up. Not that they complained for the leg up um, from the very beginning. But that is something to watch carefully. It is an orchestrated effort by the nuclear industry to push, as you understand, I probably have seen, the importance of nuclear for reliability, which is baloney. And the second, the importance of a big mix in the marketplace. And they're now claiming they're being unfairly treated, although they thought it was great and was supporting deregulation uh, from the get-go. But that's something to watch, because that could change the economic picture of nukes. Mm -hmm. Many um, Massachusetts residents also, uh, I'll get to you in a moment, um, don't know that they have a choice on their electric bill as well for where their power comes from. 
It's called the supply section of your bill. So you can actually be supporting 100% wind or 50% green energy like local solar and wind farms too. And you can switch that without a charge um, <laughs> quite easily. Um, there are third party suppliers that are by law available to all consumers. So you don't need to be supporting nuclear with your electric bill anymore. That's something we should you know, spread the word about. Something we should all do. We should all do. If we're here tonight, we obviously care about not, not supporting coal and oil and nuclear fracking. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Guntram Muir from uh, Massachusetts Peace Action. I live in Newton. Um, yeah, coming back to the question of subsidy, as you said, the biggest subsidy, I believe, is the, uh, the fact that uh, there's a limited liability to what the company would have to pay in case of a major nuclear accident. The Price-Anderson Act uh, basically says um, that you're limited, and I believe the amount, I could be wrong about this, but I believe the amount is $112 million. Well, a nuclear accident can be hundreds of billions, so 112 million is nothing. And that's in fact why it's so hard to get these safety features in there. If they actually had to pay insurance companies to insure them, they would of course do this. The insurance companies would insist that all these safety features be done because it's their money at stake. At this point, it's the taxpayers' money at stake and of course the people who live there and who stand to lose their homes and so on. So that's the subsidy. Can I say something about the electricity sure. option? We need to wrap it up very soon. Okay, this is a quickie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they make it sound very easy to change and choose, and that's good. But you have to be careful of when you do it, because... And that actually was just changed as of April 1st. There's no penalty anymore. They, they don't refigure your bill? That's right. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Um, as of April 1st, there was some, with that. No, yeah. As of April 1st, there was something called the Purchase of Receivables Act that was passed that no longer allows utilities to back charge if you change suppliers. So it's there's no sir, no fee for changing supply anymore. So, um, this is the last last two quick questions. I'm going to sum it up. Uh, just another important information on subsidies. Can has just started studying and working on uh, the next big scam, which is. Uh, the energy grid wars, we're starting to call it. Um, wind and solar are not considered suitable for baseline power because they're they, you know, are not necessarily running all the time. Um, and the nuclear industry across the country is working on state and regional uh, regulators of the grids to try to legislate in that nuclear power be a baseline source. So they'd be guaranteed, no matter what the price of their electricity, that they're going to sell it. You can talk to me later. And the last, the last question or comment. Hi, I'm Bill from Cape Town Windows. And speaking about subsidies, the insurance thing is a huge deal. It's a sweetheart deal for the for the nuclear uh, industry. They also can't get financing from Wall Street. You know, the government has to ensure that has to guarantee their loans for them to even develop or build a, a, a nuclear power plant. So, you know, this is an industry that can't function in the real world um, and is totally supported by the federal government. Were they to be required to to function the way every other corporation is, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even exist. So, um, it's not a subsidy, but it enables them to continue. And the only reason they can is because they have a strong lobby and they contribute a lot of money to politicians. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to sum it up. The Desperate Senior Center is uh, uh, allowing us to be here till 9, and it's just about 9. Um, I, I would encourage everybody to get involved in whatever way they feel comfortable. I think if somebody tells you to go talk to a politician and that's not your thing, you won't be doing it. So I think the, the better point is to do something. Pick something and do it. If writing is your thing and rallying is not, that's fine. Um, we will get the talking points up on our website soon. Definitely check out pilgrimcoalition.org and sign up for the newsletter, which comes out once a month. Encourage your friends to do the same because there are ideas and ways to get involved on those newsletters. And you can always email us at contact at pilgrimcoalition.org. Um, but please keep involved because if you sit home and you say you're too busy, nothing happens. And the way each of us got involved in something like this was by showing up to something like this with a little encouragement.
So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, if you could also fill out a, um, a survey before you leave and just put it on the sign in table, that would be very helpful. I'll pass these around. Uh, so you have one.